How's it going guys? This is going to be a review of the Creality Ender 3 S1 Pro 3D printer. The Ender 3s have a bit of a cult following in the budget 3D printing world and I have posted a few reviews of 3D printers I've purchased myself including the Ender 3 V2 that I have right here and I also own a regular Ender 3 that's way back there. So when Creality reached out and asked me if I wanted to review the Ender 3 S1 Pro, I was like, yeah, sure, why not? I was considering buying it anyways, so they saved me a few bucks. Regardless, even though Creality provided me with this printer to review, the thoughts and opinions are my own. My channel isn't really about 3D printing, but I do love 3D printing and how useful this technology has become. So if I come across printers that I think people might like, I post a review about them. Having said that, this printer has the pedigree of the Ender 3 in terms of reliability and performance, but the parts and design have all been upgraded. Creality has really made a budget 3D printer that is plug and play. Let's go over some of the specs and features of the printer. It has a print volume slightly larger than the regular Ender 3, the Pro and V2 coming in at 220 by 220 by 270 millimeters. So it's larger in the Z-axis compared to the other Ender 3s. It has an all metal dual gear direct extruder and hot end that they call the Sprite that can reach temperatures of 300 degrees Celsius. Finally, it has automatic bed leveling called CR Touch that probes 16 spots on the print bed. This is similar to the popular BL Touch. It has an LED light, a touchscreen interface, a PEI magnetic heated print bed that can reach 110 degrees Celsius, dual Z lead screws, has a USB-C connector and a regular size SD card slot, which for whatever reason, custom seems to have taken my SD card that's supposed to come with this printer because it wasn't in the package, uh, even though the printer came with an actual SD card reader as well. For the setup and slicing software, Creali recommends downloading their slicer, which I believe is a version of Cura. Now there's nothing wrong with Cura, but I use Simplify 3D. It's my preferred slicer. I already had a profile for the Ender 3, so I just used that and it worked with no issues at all. Although I should make a custom profile and increase the uh, build volume in the larger Z axis and tune the settings for the new Sprite extruder, such as things like the retraction settings. Usually an SD card comes with the printer, as I mentioned, and it has more in-depth instructions and videos for how to set up the printer. But like I said, custom seems to have seized mine. So what I like and some of the noteworthy features of this printer. Okay, so there are other reviews out there going in depth on the differences between this printer and its predecessor, the Ender 3 S1, but uh, I'll go over the things that I like about this printer. First thing is assembly is so easy. It honestly took me 10 minutes to set up this whole printer. Bolt the gantry to the base, attach the direct drive hot end extruder to the printer, plug in a few connectors and you're done. I didn't even have to tension any of the belts. They did all that from factory, it seems. Now, the direct drive extruder and hot end is a cool piece of engineering. Not having used one before, like a direct drive unit, uh, I wasn't sure what all the fuss was about. But having used one now, I can totally see the benefits. No Bowden tube to deal with or replace, and it opens up harder to print filaments that require hotter temperatures than PLA. Not that you couldn't print filaments like TPU and PETG in the regular Ender 3s, but where this all metal extruder is going to shine is in the long run. Printing materials that require hotter temperatures starts breaking down the Bowden tubes as the tube extends deep into the hot end. Such as this is a hot end from my Ender 3 V2 that got all messed up because the Bowden tube broke down and started causing all kinds of jamming um, and just weird, you know, the filament wouldn't feed at all. So you can see on the end here, it's a little bit black and it's got all kinds of goo and crud on it. And what happens is this heat break, this tube, the Bowden tube fits all the way down. And then on this end, you have the nozzle that mats up against it inside of this heat sink. Now, this is a very inexpensive part to replace, but you'll find you'll have to replace it more often or the Bowden tube 
when you're printing materials that require hotter temperatures, the, you know, the mean time between failures is going to be shorter than say, if you're just printing PLA. So, you know, like I said, you can see these uh, pieces of the hot end are all weird and discolored. And this one actually jams so much I had to replace it. Okay, so one other thing about the extruder and hot end assembly, it's a small thing, but loading filament in this extruder is so much easier than machines that use a Bowden tube. Trying to feed the end of a piece of filament that you may or may not have cut, you know, on the correct angle into the Bowden tube can be a real pain. So any of you guys who have a machine like that, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. So, you know, this dual gear direct drive means less filament jamming and printing flexible filaments is not an issue. Then again, I was able to print TPU on the regular Ender 3. You just got to slow the uh, print speeds down. This printer still uses rollers and not linear rods, which honestly, having used printers with linear rods and bearings, the rollers seem a lot easier to uh, maintain and replace when you need to. And they're really readily available and easy to get. Now this printer has a light and I like using OctoPrint to monitor prints with a webcam. This guy right here, this is my webcam that's connected to OctoPrint. Uh, and it's nice not to have to leave uh, the you know, light on down in the basement here to be able to monitor my prints. So yeah, I really love that light. It's built in, it's fantastic. It sounds silly to be excited about a light, but this is the first printer that I've owned that has seemed to done a proper implementation of installing a light. As you can see here, it's illuminated all my prints that I've done on this printer really well. Uh, it does a great job. Now the printer is quiet. I think it uses the, you know, the ever popular TMC 2208 stepper motor drivers. Uh, very quiet unit. The only thing you're gonna really hear are the cooling fans that have a bit of a whirling sound. But for me, I don't really care about noise since my printers are in the basement anyways. But if that's something that matters to you, something to consider. It has dual lead Z screws. So the Z axis should be nice and stable, especially when you're printing larger items, taller prints. The CR touch bed leveling works well, but I did have to adjust the Z offset to a negative value before running the auto bed leveling. It wasn't uh, described very well in the manual. So at first it was just printing in the air until I adjusted the Z offset and then re-leveled the bed. I do like that this printer has manual adjustments still. In case something goes wrong with the CR touch bed leveling, and it also comes with an extra Z axis end switch that isn't installed, but you can install yourself that uh, will allow you to manually level the bed in case you don't want to use CR touch or if it breaks. For instance, as an aside, my Anycubic Viper has been out of commission for many weeks now. Well, mel well over a month because I'm waiting on a strain gauge part for the automatic bed leveling on that printer. So that printer is essentially out of commission because there's no manual bed leveling on that. So I can't use that printer. It's just sitting there. I did do a bed level test after leveling to see how well it worked and it's really good, no issues. Here it is here. It's nice and flat, level, did a great job. It has a filament runout sensor and it works, but unfortunately OctoPrint doesn't seem to have support for it yet. So it's kind of not useful for me unless I'm printing from the SD card. So speaking of SD cards, it's got a full size SD card slot and finally uses a USB-C connector instead of the micro USB connectors on the uh, other Ender 3s. Thermal runaway protection is enabled on the printer and I verified it by unplugging the temperature sensor until the printer uh, threw a fault code. I didn't test the heated print bed for a thermal runaway, but it's a good sign that at least some implementation of thermal runaway is uh, installed on this printer. I love the magnetic PEI print bed. It's textured on one side and smooth on the other. I've printed on both and it works as you would expect for this type of print bed. I like this print surface so much that I even upgraded my Ender 3 V2 to have one as well. As you can see right here, it's awesome for printing PLA, especially objects with a large base as you don't have to pry the print off. Once cooled, it just releases with no effort. 
Um, but for some materials such as ASA, it's best to apply some blue painter's tape on the smooth side and print on that. As some uh, materials adhere a little too well to the PEI surface and can be damaged when you're removing the printed object. The grab handle is a nice addition so you're not grabbing onto a hot print bed. Instead of a dial like the other Ender 3s, it finally has a touch screen which is so much nicer. Okay, let's talk about print quality. So the print quality is what you would expect from this printer. It's great. I print mostly functional parts such as these, uh, like this surfboard fin here, uh, which I printed at 100% infill. It's super smooth, really nice super strong. I've had them out in my board out in a few sessions and they're still holding up really good. I did print some decorative prints as well such as this bust of Deadpool. It came out super smooth and yeah it looks real nice. You know the lines are good. There's no uh, weird artifacting or anything like that. Now of course I did print a few benchies uh, in, in different materials and using different slicer settings. So the one in PLA came out really good as expected. I do still need to tune some of the print settings but overall I printed this I think at 80 millimeters a second or maybe even 100 millimeters a second. Yeah I think it was 100 and uh, it did a great job. Also this benchy here is printed in PETG but uh, this slicer setting definitely will need, still need some tweaking because PETG is a little finicky. It's very prone to stringing and I still have yet to really get a handle printing in that material because I don't do a lot of it. But you can see there's stringing. Overall though, this is still very acceptable. Now also I should mention having a heated filament spool holder is a must for when you're printing PETG. Previous to that, my prints were not coming out well. I had real problems with delamination and separation. It just wasn't good. But once I got a heated uh, filament holder, uh, my prints improved like dramatically. So highly recommend. So yeah, overall the Benchies all came out decent. And I also printed one in ASA. This one came out really well, but on the bow, I did have a little bit of an, uh, an issue here, but the rest of the print came out great. So yeah, just that little minor issue. Also, can I just say that I appreciate that it came with a materials guide cheat sheet as a starting point for the print settings, such as nozzle temperature, fan speed, and retraction settings. It's not perfect, but at least I have a baseline that I can build from, and I don't have to go online every time and you know look up a print setting. I've always had a hard time printing ABS, mostly because I don't have a print enclosure. I don't often need to print ABS, but with the Sprite Hot End, I can now print a similar material to ABS, which I just mentioned uh, that I printed this Benchy in, ASA. Now the benefits of ASA is it doesn't shrink nearly as badly as ABS, but it does require a hotter print temperature. So the S1 Pro can totally do that. This bracket here is going to be exposed to the elements and out in UV light. And this was printed in ASA and it came out great, super strong. I think I printed this at a 100% infill even too. So yeah, this hot, hot end also opens up the possibility of me being able to print some nylon that I want to try as well. This tire is printed in flexible TPU. It was a breeze to print with the dual gear direct drive extruder, no issues with jamming at all, even at faster print speeds. It's cool. Finally, I printed some 3D printer calibration tests. Of course, the Maker's Muse clearance castle passed with flying colors, the bridging, there's no uh, jammed parts or anything. It all comes apart with no issues. So from the factory, this printer seems to be calibrated really well. I also printed this other little calibration test and you can see here the bridging came out great, no issues, and uh, the overhangs as well. So yeah, here's all the stuff I printed so far with this printer and it meets my requirements. I haven't noticed any issue with ghosting that can happen with a direct drive extruder unit, but uh, it could be because I wasn't pushing the print speeds like too crazy. Okay, a few things to note that could be issues or minor annoyances. It does have a resume print function if the power goes off. 
but if it takes a while for the power to come back on, your print is going to unstick from the PEI print bed. So yeah, that could be a little bit of an issue. So yeah, it's only really useful in limited situations. Now it's got this single ribbon cable, which is nice and tidy, but when you need to do a repair, it could be an issue when tracing wires. Um, it's an unlikely situation because I'd imagine you would just replace the whole cable is probably their intention. But yeah, you know, that could be something because I have worked on other printers um, and had to do some wiring and stuff. But who knows, just something to note. I'm not 100% sure what nozzles the printer uses, but it came with one spare nozzle and it looks like a regular nozzle from an Ender Free will also fit. So I still have yet to test that. And as mentioned earlier, the touch screen is awesome, but the UI and menus could use some tweaking, maybe even just changing the naming of the menus. But yeah, other than that, uh, I almost never use the menus except for leveling since I print with OctoPrint. The manual is Spartan, so don't expect too much from it. I think there is more information on the SD card, but like I said earlier, mine didn't come with one as it, you know, custom seems to have taken it. So if this is your first 3D printer, be sure to watch a bunch of YouTube videos on the setup of this printer just to get a sense of how it works and what you can expect. So my overall impressions of the Ender 3 S1 Pro is it's almost plug and play and if you have no experience in 3D printing, I can recommend this printer for a total beginner. If you don't plan on printing materials that require hotter temperatures, you can save a few bucks by getting the S1. That appears to be just as user-friendly, just minus some of the other features such as the upgraded hot end. But if you are on a budget, I honestly would go with the original Ender 3 or any one of its variations. It's really the best value 3D printer for the home user if you don't mind tinkering a little bit and there is some assembly required, you know, because it's got such a huge following and community. There's a lot of resources out there for those printers. And personally, I think it's got the sweet spot for cost and performance. So that's my review of the Creality Ender 3 S1 Pro. I hope you found it helpful and I will see you guys in another video.